Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm still Anne-Marie, still an alcoholic. Um, okay, so I gave you the examples of the resentments, um, and I just want to touch briefly on one of the times that I did a um, resentment inventory that was completely different than any type of four-column inventory was with the woman that I had worked with in London. And uh, it was actually three columns, and it introduced all the it introduced these seven deadly sins from the step book also. Um, so it was literally I, I had a resentment, and it was one sheet of paper, and it made things actually very simple. I very much enjoyed it because it really helped me with six and seven. Um, but it was I uh, at the top of the page I would write you know who I was angry with, like why I was angry, and who I was angry with, and then I would just go through fourteen character defects. And it was, you know, anger, which was anger and arrogance, pride, self-pity, self-centered fear, selfishness, um, gluttony, greed, impatience and intolerance, uh, sloth, lust, gluttony, greed, jealousy, envy, personal relations, and dishonesty, and I already said sloth. And I would just go through, and I would literally how, write how this resentment Every single place worked at worked out that way, um, and one of the that's where I started to really see that my dishonesty was getting very clever. <laughs> my dishonesty was not so much about like you know you ask me where is you know where's my driver's license and I say I don't know knowing full well I stole it. Um, that's a lie, so that would be dishonest, right? Or you asking me where's my driver's license and I just kind of look around the other way. I don't really say anything. That's, you know, not telling the truth by omission. Um, I found that my dishonesty was taking on a different role, which in my sobriety was causing me a lot of pain um, and a lot of judgment. And I found that when I was doing that type of work with her, a lot of my judgment was taken away because I started to see that a lot of my resentment was stemmed in the fact of, of the behavior that I used to behave in and or the behavior I was actually doing and wanted to get away with. So I'll give you an example. My sister-in-law is uh, somebody I've always struggled to get along with. Just a little bit of family background. I um, My brother met her, I, I don't know, in like 1999 or something. I was sober when they met. And uh, she was very kind with me. She's a therapist, social worker. Um, she gave me, you know, one day at a time books, like when they first started dating, because she, you know, was relating to me on that level, which I appreciated because she was really the one person that was, um, she was trying very hard in that direction. Now, then they decided to get married, and she and my mother butt heads a lot. And my mother and I were very, very close. So I immediately hate her because she's hurting my mother. Totally reasonable, right? You're a loyal family member. You made my mom cry every day for a year planning a wedding. I hate you, okay? Seems totally rational and reasonable to me because I am a loyal family member. That's how I defined myself in AA. At this point, I had actually already been through the steps too. So once I tell you my behavior, you're going to be a little scared. Um, but uh, I had, um, you know, it seems totally reasonable and rational to me because to me, loyalty was the ultimate thing. To me, you know, you don't hurt my mom. Nobody gets away with that. And um, so we go through the wedding, and I completely acted out numerous times, always with that motive of protecting my family, always with that motive of, you know, um, doing what's right. Now, the reason that I bring this up is because this girl became one of my biggest teachers as to I don't necessarily know what's right, nor really is what's right for you any of my business, okay? Um, so I, uh, you know, I mean, I did things like where my brother and I had gotten into a huge fight, and um, uh, we had gotten into huge fights over it, where I would just say, like, you know, mean things, and, and basically by the time the wedding came around, my brother's, my relationship was also very strained. Now, my brother's and my relationship was really strained in general just because also of my drinking. 
when I was drinking, he, uh, he basically had said to me, like, I, I pretty much disown you. Like, you're not my sister. You're an embarrassment. I want nothing to do with you. And I can't say I blame him. Um, when this happened with my brother, I felt so right and so indignant that there was no way that I was possibly wrong on this. Okay. So I go through the four column inventory and I see, okay, maybe their wedding is none of my business. Okay, fine. I can, I can get with the fact that their wedding is none of my business. She's still evil, but the wedding is none of my business. I get that. Okay. And then I go through the four, in the four column inventory. I see like, okay, I don't necessarily have to like you. I just have to accept you. Okay. I can, I can get with that concept. And, uh, I also see that, um, you know, that I'm running on a big fear that I'm going to lose my brother, that, you know, my brother and I are not going to be close. Why? Because with her, because of her behavior, he doesn't want to hang out with our family. Has nothing to do with my behavior. Okay. Because of her behavior, she doesn't, he doesn't want to hang out with our family. So now I'm afraid of that. And that's as far as I could get with the four column inventory. And it's, you know, and it was, it was good. It was all right. I can handle being around you. So now I see her at family occasions. I'm like, how are you? I'm pleasant. I'm cordial. But there's no true relationship. There's no recognition of a God, my God to her God. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, she has no God. So it was like, you know, my God was looking and I couldn't find it. Um, and so I, uh, I get to, I get to the point now where I've moved to London. Now I come home and it is, um, my brother's, it's my nephew's second birthday party. And I had spent, you know, during that year, I had sent my nephew, his name is Peter. I had sent him numerous things, love, Aunt Sugar. That's my name in the family, Aunt Sugar, right? So, um, for whatever reason, at the birthday party, my brother comes in and I'm like holding Peter and I'm like, oh, you know, Aunt Sugar does this, Aunt Sugar does that. He's like, yeah, it's not Aunt Sugar. And I was like, what? He's like, it's Aunt Anne Marie. And I was like, what? No, it's not. It's Aunt Sugar. And he's like, no, really. It's Aunt Anne Marie. We don't like Aunt Sugar. We think it's stupid. Mind you, my brother's the one that gave me this name Sugar when I was a kid. So I was like, okay. Now, thank God for God and AA. Because my reaction to that, instead of it being, you know, are you kidding me in a bunch of expletives, was to stand up and say, okay, no problem. Um, I'll be right back. And I walk outside and I start bawling. I am sobbing. I am sobbing because I feel left out. I feel, you know, not a part of, I feel all of these things. I feel like I'm not good enough that no matter what I do, blah, blah, blah. I start going down that victim road. No matter what I do, I send this kid presents. I can't have a relationship with him. No matter what I do, like what? You don't think Aunt Sugar's stupid? And I look to, you know, I'm thinking of her. I'm like, she thinks it's stupid. And I just immediately go down that whole path, right? Well, it doesn't help now. My mom sees me. Oh no, what'd she do? This is right. So now she, what did she do to my daughter? Now we're playing off each other, right? So I was like, nothing. She did nothing. We're not going to talk about it. And um, I come back in, and she, um, my sister-in-law, came walking by me, and she's holding Peter. And she comes walking by me, and she walks past me, and she turns around, and she starts yelling at me. Now, I don't remember what she said, but I do remember I was looking at the floor. I was looking at the pattern on the carpet because I was trying to focus on not crying, and I did not want to respond. So she yelled, and then she ended up leaving the birthday party with Peter, saying that I yelled and scared Peter, and that's why now this birthday party was over. So that was a nice day. And uh, I go back to my ha I go back home and I call my sponsor in London. And I'm like, can you believe this woman? And I am flying off the handle about this woman. And she's like, can you see it? And I'm like, can I see what? She goes, can you see it? I'm like, see what? She goes, that this woman is exactly like you. And I lost it. <laughs> I don't think you needed the telephone for her to hear me in London. Um, I was not pleased with that response. I was not happy about that response. I totally disagreed with that response. I was like, there is no way I am like this woman. And then she was like, why don't you think about it and call me back? And I sat down and I got quiet and I said my fourth step prayer and I did my, I did my resentment sheet. And, uh, 
mind you, this is probably the 50th resentment sheet I've done on this woman, but for some reason it, it cleared that day. And for some reason I all of a sudden could see that actually I had behaved just like this woman. That the dishonesty here was, was that I too would cause fights in the family for no reason. That I too had an idea of what was right that I too had an idea of how the day was supposed to go, and if it didn't go that way, I would freak out. That I too needed to be in charge of the day, that I too was operating. I, If I could get away with operating how she was operating, I would do it. Difference between us, I'm an alcoholic, I can't get away with it. Difference between us is that I have this program, and I know that I don't have to do that. The difference between us is that I no longer have to behave that way because I have a God in my life that shows me it can be, I can be wrong and I'm okay with that. That I don't have to be in charge and I'm okay with that. I have a program that says that I can, um, I can share. If I had a son, I can share my son. That I can allow other people to pick their names. That I don't have to be in charge of it. I can, um, I can do a lot of things that she does. And, um, I don't have to do that anymore, but that before I had AA, I too had tendencies to behave the same way and would do the same thing. And that dishonesty cleared a huge, huge resentment at that time where, um, the next day my brother sat the two of us down and she said a whole bunch of things that actually didn't happen when we were standing in that room. And I just, um, and then she walked away and I just looked at my brother and I said, it didn't happen that way. And he said, I understand. He goes, but at the end of the day, I'm married. And right there, it just said everything. So right there, I was open to hear what my brother needed. My brother needed me to just accept the fact that this is the way it was. If I wanted to have him in my life. And that my purpose with my brother at that time to be useful to him was to shut my mouth and stay out of it and try and make his life a little easier when he comes to the house. I don't need to be right. I don't need to have my values accepted by everybody. I need to see how I can be of service to them. And being of service to my brother in that relationship for the next few years was making it as easy as possible upon him when he came to the house with his wife and asking how she's doing and asking how I can help with the kids, and checking to make sure that, you know, I'm doing something that they that they want me to do rather than just taking over. And that started to foster a relationship with my brother that I never thought was possible. And um, the reason that I bring that resentment up is also just to show how old resentments can revive themselves. And years later, I can even see another level of dishonesty. Because years later, I was married. And years later, my husband was doing something that my mother didn't like. And what ended up happening was that my mother called my stepbrother and my, and, and other people in the family started holding resentments against my husband. My mother's perception was not the truth of what was happening. And I realized then, at 12 years sober, that at two years sober, I was reacting based upon my mother's perception. That wasn't necessarily even the truth that I had harmed my relationship with my brother, that I destroyed any possible closeness that I could have had with my sister-in-law for 10 years based upon what my mother was saying. I never went and asked them, what happened? Why is mom crying? I never stopped. I just reacted because my mom was upset. And when it happened to me, I was in the same place as my brother, where my brother, where it was like it was uncomfortable to go to the house now. It was uncomfortable to be there. And I had a whole new level of respect and understanding for both my brother and my sister-in-law. And when I ended up going through a really hard time in my life two years ago where my husband and I split up and we ended up getting divorced, it was my brother that came down that day that my husband left and took me to dinner for us to talk. And it was his wife who periodically texted me to see how I was doing and inviting me over. And thank God for the growing levels of honesty, 
Just because we do this work once doesn't mean we don't do it twice or three times or four times. I hear a lot in AA, you know, you only have to do a four-step once. Okay, fine. How free do you want to be? You can do one step, four step, that's fine. But that's one resentment that I inventory over a period of 10 years, <laughs> periodically when it would come up, and I'm free of it today. I'm free of it today. And I have no doubt it's going to come up in another year or two over some other issue, and somehow I'll get free over that, you know, and I'll be like, oh. That was operating back then too, you know. But for me, at different levels, at different times, God shows me things periodically. More will be, more will be revealed. If I knew what I knew today at one year sober, I don't know if I'd keep coming, you know. And I don't know today what I'll know at 30 years sober, which is good because I don't know if I'd keep coming, you know. It gets revealed as I'm supposed to go, and um, the relationships, and I, you know, I have, I have been known to be like, there's no way that God's going to fix this one. You know, and I have been proven wrong. So, having said that, we'll move on to, there's two other types of inventory, and that is the fear and the, um, the sex inventory. And the fear inventory for me, um, again, I've done it a number of different ways. Um, the first time I did the fear inventory, I, uh, the first time I did the fear inventory, it was, you know, write down the fear, write down the opposite fear, what's the earliest memory of it, and how does it play out? And that was actually really helpful for me because what I actually saw from that fear inventory was that while I was afraid to, uh, I, you know, I was always like, I don't want to go to college because I'm afraid I'm going to fail. What's the opposite of failure? Success. I actually also had a fear of success. I didn't know I had it. So the exercise of writing down what the actual fear was and then also the opposite of it, I could then in my fifth step ask, like, you know, do, am I also afraid to succeed? Yes, I was. You know, I'm terrified of people. I'm also terrified of being alone. You know, I'm, I'm afraid to, like, you know, I'm, a, uh, I'm afraid of heights, but I'm also afraid to go underwater. Like, the whole thing is, is that as an alcoholic, to me, what cracks me up and also at the same time, <laughs> it's not very nice, is that where do you go when you're afraid of people and you're afraid to be alone? Like, where do you go? It's, it cracks me up because I'm like, seriously, God, we have to live in the moment with you. Like, it's not optional because I don't, I'm too, I'm too afraid to talk to you people because I don't know you, but I'm also too afraid to go sit there in that chair by myself and with my own thoughts. And if you were in my head, you would know why, you know? And it's like, so I started to see that I actually had a lot of both fears. I had the actual fear and the opposite of the fear. And when that happens, which is what happens here on page 68, it says we reviewed our fears thoroughly, which is what I did when we put them on paper. And even though we may have had no resentment in connection with them, we asked ourselves why we have them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. And the self-reliance here, to me, goes back to page um, 50. Three, when it talks about that bridge of reason. The bridge of reason is, to me, the self-reliance that they're talking about. I could get my being afraid to fly, right? Okay, so there, there's a good example of a current, or not current, but like more recent fear, is that being afraid to fly. But I was also afraid to stay home because I didn't want to miss out on life. So I drove to Canada. You know, it's like the self-reliance got me to start doing things that would be like, okay, so I don't have to deal with either fear. Whereas if I just literally did exactly what a piss said on page 68, and that is recognize how did the self-reliance fail me? Well, no matter what I did when I got on a plane, I on my own power could not calm myself down. I needed a, I needed a higher power in order to do that. The self-reliance had failed me. I can't get to Europe without getting on a plane. You know, I'm not a very good swimmer. I am not going to swim the Atlantic Ocean to get there, nor am I going to get on a boat to get there. You know, so, okay, so now self-reliance has failed me because I can't necessarily get there without doing this. Um, and then it says it was good enough, but it didn't, uh, it was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us had great confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem. And uh, the next paragraph became very, very important to me because what I started to see was that not only 
how had my self-reliance failed in terms of keeping this fear in check? How had my self-reliance failed and how was the fear playing out in my life and blocking my life? Um, I saw that no matter what I did on my own power, I could not remove it. That was the importance of seeing how had the self-reliance failed me. It was, again, going back to step one. If I truly had no power, I can't change this. And I love the part where it talks about fear ought to be classed with stealing because it causes, uh, it causes us more trouble. There are so many things in my life that I have, that I did not do because I was afraid. There are so many things in my life that sometimes I don't want to do because I am afraid. There are things that I will deny myself, experiences I will deny myself because of fear. And that way to me is that it's, it's it's this awful corroding thread, like it says in the book, because it takes so much of my God away from me when I don't turn to the solution of it. And the reason I say my God away from me is because I truly believe that every experience I have is another experience to relate to God, to get to know God, to somehow experience whatever I'm supposed to experience here. So it says, perhaps there is a better way. We think so, for we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite self. We are in the world to play the role he assigns, just to the extent that we do as he think he would have us and humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity. And I wrote in over calamity, I wrote in chaos with serenity, and I put peace of mind. Because that's the change where I recognize it. So what I would do with each fear is I would ask myself, am I now on a basis where I can, where I live on a basis of trusting and relying on God? If the answer is yes, I move on. Do I trust infinite God rather than my finite self? I can do that here. Okay, keep going. Do I believe I am in the world to, pl I am in the world to play the role he assigns me? Okay. Yes, I do believe that. I do believe that. Okay. So here's the kicker. Just to the extent that we do as he think he would have us and humbly rely on him, does he enable me to match the chaos with peace of mind? So literally when I have a fear, I go through that paragraph and I turn each one into the question and I ask myself, do I believe I'm here to play that role? Well, yes, I do. Okay. So you feel a little fear. But if the role is presenting itself, get up. Get up. Because it tells me in the next paragraph that uh, faith means courage and that all men of faith have courage. You don't need courage if you don't feel fear. So that tells us we're going to feel it. But the difference between God working and the disease working is the disease, I'm going to stay in bed. God work, I'm like, I get up and I'm like, oh, dear God, let's go. Okay, we can do this. Come on, put the foot down, put the foot in front. Okay, keep going, keep going. Sweating, sweating, you know, like breath smells, whatever. And I'm like, okay, keep going, keep going. And then I go and I do it and I'm like, huh, that wasn't that bad. That wasn't that bad at all. And what my disease can sometimes do, be like, I wasn't really afraid. I knew I could do it. Who did it? I didn't do it. I showed up. God did it. You know, so some of you have actually said to me, you know, today and last night, like, thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. You've helped me a lot. I haven't. I no, mm, Not me, not Anne Marie. But I've shown up. I show up and God shows up. God's always present. You know, and that's, that's to me how this works. So there's the fear prayer at the bottom where it says, we ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once we commence to outgrow fear. And again, it says we commence to outgrow. We begin to outgrow. It doesn't mean that the fear miraculously like gets kicked to the wayside as if it never existed. It's just as I take steps, it gets smaller. It gets smaller and smaller until I'm on the other side and I tell you I wasn't afraid. Um, so then we move on to the sex inventory. And um, the sex inventory... Um, for me, was was extremely important. And there were two parts of the sex inventory that I went through. And um, basically, I sat down and I wrote down all of the people that I had ever had any type of romantic relationship with. And um, it was, you know, it consisted of boyfriends. It consisted of people that I just kind of hung out with. 
um, in terms of like, you know, maybe went out with once or twice. It really consisted of, and I don't mean to be like crude or anything, it really consisted of whatever I could remember, to be quite honest with you. Because when I was out there drinking, there were times that I woke up and I looked next to me and I'm like, who are you? And what is your name? Or I would literally, call, you know, be like, hey, Chad, you need to get up. He's like, my name's Jeff. I'm like, sorry, dude, you got to go. You know, um, and it's not something I'm necessarily proud of. And had I been living this way of life, would I have done that? Probably not. No. But when I was in my disease, did I do it? Absolutely, I did it. And it's now part of who I am. I need to take a look at it. And I need to also take a look at the actual, the, the sexual acts, too. Like, I know that um, Dave and I will talk about this sometimes, that uh, he'll, he'll tell me, you know, that they focus more on the relationship stuff, which is good. And I need to, you know, take a look at the relationship stuff. But especially, at least with me and my history, too, because, like I said, I was a victim of sexual abuse. And while I was out there, I was also a victim of stranger rape. I need to take, I have issues with that. And I go to, I, I've gone to lots and lots of therapy with it, and I've gone through a lot of processes to get to where I am now. And I can tell you that I stand here 100% free in that area of my life. I never thought that was possible. I am 100% free, and I am now comfortable with my sexuality. But it took a lot of honest work at taking a look at not just the relationship aspects of it, but also the actual sexual acts of it. You know, my sponsor, this was the woman I was working with in London, she said to me, when you are writing about the relationship, ask God to show you how you also felt and what you did sexually in that relationship and what, how did, what do you bring away from that? How can you tell were you selfish and dishonest in that actual area? Can you tell that you were inconsiderate in that area? Did you hurt somebody in that area with all of that? It wasn't just about the actual intimacy of I see you, you see me. It was also about the act itself. And especially with women, because we're just all sorts of complicated with messages in society, and I don't necessarily need to stand here and explain that to you. Um, but the messages that we would get also from being an alcoholic woman of, you know, blowjobs and what those are about, of, you know, different positions in bed and what those were about and whether it was okay that you had a one-night stand and whether or not it was, you know, how did people look at you? Why were you called a whore? And things like that. And it was important, and it is important, to look at those things because we're kidding ourselves if we just want to put it in a box and pretend it doesn't exist. It is part of us, and it is a part of life that I don't know about you, I wanted to be happy, joyous, and free in. So I sat down to do the work and talked about a lot of really uncomfortable things. And thank God I found this woman in London who was super comfortable with it. And I was like, wow. You know, she was like, I won't judge you. And after I heard her story, I was like, now I know why. Um, you know, it was like, I was, I'd never even heard of anything like that. I was like, y can you do that? I didn't think that was against, I thought that was against the law. And, um, I was like, holy wow. And I all of a sudden became Mother Teresa listening to this woman. I was like, wow, I haven't done anything. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that I had to take a look at it because we are human beings. We are emotional beings. We're intellectual beings. We're sexual beings. We're, you know, physical beings. That's all part of us. And a lot of times I hear people say, how free do you want to be? And this is a good place to ask yourself because your level of thoroughness and honesty here will determine how free you really want to be. So I went through and I saw that in my relationships I was doing the same thing over and over again. And I shared a little bit about this last night where it was, quite frankly, and again, I'm not proud of this because I know people out there are going to have judgments on it, but do you know how many people I dated that I never wanted to date? Like, my disease, my, my beliefs of being inadequate – my disease of needing you to validate me meant that I would share my body with somebody I didn't even find attractive, all just to validate me. That's the depths of my selfishness. I would take something like that from you for the depths of my selfishness. And that's something that I have to make amends for and that I have made amends for. I did things, um, you know, where it was like literally entering a relationship where it was just all about me. The step book talks about the fact that we're people who aren't very good at relationships, and I think that's a good understatement. Um, very nice way to put it. 
um, of being the tornado. But, you know, um, and then what I would do is I would lie to get out of the relationship because I never wanted to be there in the first place. And when I lied to get out of the relationship, you think I took responsibility for that? Mm -mm. Nope, not happening. I blamed you. It was all your fault. And I even have one relationship where it was I came out with this huge lie and really, really harmed somebody. And um, it was somebody that I never should have dated to start with because I didn't, I didn't even necessarily like them. But I always felt like, well, I should just give them a chance. Well, you know, maybe I'm just not seeing something in them. Well, you know, I mean, he likes me, so why not? We'll see. He can't be bad. You know, not realizing that that actually comes from an incredible selfish motive and I'm going to cause a lot of harm. You know, so I ended up dating this one person who lives down in Louisiana. I lived in Louisiana at the time and um, I did what I firmly believed to be among the worst things that anybody has ever done. And it's the thing that... Um, actually came up after my fifth step that got me to go back and tell my sponsor because when it came up in my head, I was like, oh, no, we're not telling you that. Mm -mm. No, nope, that's not coming out. That's going to the grave. And as I had that thought during my hour after the fifth step, I could taste alcohol in my mouth. I literally tasted it. And so I went back and I told her. And uh, what I'll tell you now because I am free of it. And that is that um, there was this man who I was dating who was very kind to me. He was very nice to me. Um, he wasn't an angel, but I wasn't either. So, um, and this is the guy that he, you know, he asked me out. I was like, oh, okay, fine, he'll go out. And then he kissed me. And next thing you know, I'm in a relationship for six months. And I'm like, how did this happen? I didn't even, like, I didn't want to go out with you. I wanted to go out with your best friend. I didn't want to, how did this happen? And so when I um, broke up with him, I was in the middle, I was at the height of my drinking. And one of the things that happened to me in all my blackouts is I woke up with a lot of bruises all the time. Don't ask me where they came from. I have no idea. I'm very klutzy. I could only get home if I ran. I did trip over trees a lot. If anybody's been to New Orleans, you know that those sidewalks are dangerous. Um, but I just, you know, and I also, since I wasn't eating, like, I could hit my arm against the door and I end up with, like, a welt, right? So I say to this guy's best friend, who's also my best friend, that I want to break up with him because he hit me. He never lay a finger on me. He never touched me that way. And it was the worst thing in the world for me to do, according to me, because my mom was a victim of domestic violence. I know what domestic violence does. And my selfishness to that depth was, I just never, you know, I didn't think it would go beyond this person. I didn't think of how it would affect this person. I was just running completely on fear and self-will. And, uh, so I told this person that, and he confronted him, who then confronted me, and I just pretended like it never happened. Just totally ignored it. Totally ignored it. And um, years later, I ended up, when I finally got sober, I told this person who was his best friend that I had lied and that he never did that. And he was like, I was afraid that you did that. And I said, why? And he goes, because I just never could imagine that he did that, but you always woke up with bruises, so I never really knew, and I wanted to help you. And he said, so I stopped talking to him. Now, this just goes to show the type of one lie, the devastating effect it can have on somebody else. And about four years ago, I finally found this guy. Because, of course, he has like a name like John Smith on Facebook, which is not helpful to find him. But I finally found him, and I uh, Facebooked him, and I said, um, can, can we talk? And he said, no. So I said, listen, I need to make amends to you. I said, I've been doing a lot of soul searching, and I would really, I, I know that I harmed you, and I, I think I know what I did, but I'm open to hearing whatever you think I did, um, and I would really like to come see you to do that. I said, I will just come and meet you for lunch. Now, again, he's in Louisiana. So, and remember, I'm terrified of flying. So, um, I, uh, he was like, yeah, he's like, you know what? He's like, let me talk to my wife. Maybe I'll be open to it. His wife sends me a letter, a message. And she says, why do you want to come? And so I said, you know, can I have your phone number? And I basically ended up just telling his wife, I said, here's the deal. 
I know I harmed your husband. I know that what I did was extremely wrong. I know that I never should have done it. And I can't tell you why I did it, except just that I was, I wasn't thinking. And it was selfish and it was obviously dishonest. Um, and I would like to clear that up with him and give him the opportunity of anything he has to say to me. I am happy to have you there because I'm sure this has harmed you also. I said, you are more than welcome to join us. I, I, and I will stay for an hour and leave. And she said, no, I just wanted to make sure your motives are okay. So you can come. I said, okay, thank you. So I get on the plane. I'm terrified to fly. I get on the plane. And the only thing that soothes me when I get on the plane is to start writing out the things I'm going to say to him. So in other words, God is soothing me on the plane. I get down there. I get in my rental car. And by the way, I've never done this before. I've never flown somewhere by myself, rented a car by myself, and driven someplace by myself. So I was like, okay, we can do this. Big girls, we can do this. So I get in the car. I call him. He's friendly. He's like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, good, how are you? He's like, good. He's like, all right, you want to meet at this place? I'm like, sure, we'll meet at that place. I'll be there in like 20 minutes. He's like, okay. And I was like, thank you so much for agreeing to see me. I really appreciate it. He's like, no problem. And uh, I get there. I walk in. Of course, we're meeting at a bar. So I get there. I walk in, and I'm like, okay. And then he comes in, and I'm like, hi, how are you? And he just looked at me. He goes, hello. Turns around and walks to a table. I'm like, oh, this is going to go well. So I go over, and I sit down, and I said, um, but, oh, and before I actually made this amends, I uh, called the other guy just to make sure that the person I was making amends to knew that I had said this lie because I wasn't going to tell him something he didn't know about himself necessarily. And he said, yes, I told him. So I said, okay. So I sit down, and I'm like, listen, I'm like, I um, am so sorry. I told him exactly what I did. I said, I don't know why I did it. It was among the more selfish and evil things I've ever done. I said, and you never deserved it, and you were very kind to me. Forget about everything else that happened between us. You were very good to me, and no one deserves anything like this. And then I said, do you have some, you know, do you want to tell me how this affected you? He's like, yeah. And I was like, okay. And uh, so he started talking. And it turns out that he was angry because apparently I had said other things I never knew I said. I don't remember saying them. And then once he said that, that I said that, I was like, oh, you're right. I did say that. I am so sorry. And I don't even remember what it was, like now telling you. I don't remember necessarily what it was. But the point is, is that as I sat there and I made this amends, I literally saw this man who came in hunched over and angry and pale white and he literally started to rise up and his shoulders went back and there became a light in his eyes and there was a sparkle by the end. And all I did was show up for God because I saw in this inventory the degree of damage that I did. And I could see the truth about it. So from me doing this work, not only did I see the truth about me, and I became unblocked from God. But seeing that gave him the freedom to become unblocked that way also. And it was an amazing experience. And after an hour, I left. And it was clear we would never see each other again. We would never speak again. And we were both fine with that. And I wished him well. And I got came back. And I got on the plane. I have never been afraid to fly since. And that's how this program works. When I take care of over here on my left, God removes over here on my right, and I never know what's coming, you know. But doing this work has is what enables me to do that and what enables God to use me. And just the last thing that I'll throw out here is that the sex ideal, I'm at the bottom of page 69, where I sat down. Um, the first time I sat down and wrote it out, it was everything that I wanted in, like, you know, the perfect guy. And it was a fabulous list. I had all these great ideas of what I wanted in the perfect man, right? And then my sponsor was like, okay, now you're going to fold that in, pat in half, and now you're going to write everything you need to bring in order to get that. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to necessarily work for this, you know? Um, and so that actually really helped me because a lot of my, my uh, pattern was that I didn't necessarily know what I wanted. So my dishonesty, I would enter into relationships I had no business entering into. Because I never asked myself, what do I want? I never put myself in that equation. So I was like, okay, well, what do I want? I don't know. 
And so I started thinking about it. And then it enabled me, like, one of the things I wanted was I wanted to go dancing a lot. I love dancing. So now on the other side, you would think, okay, I need to go dancing. Or, you know what I mean? No. I love dancing. I put on the other side, I need to participate in something he loves to do. You know, I want, I want somebody who's kind and considerate. So what do I need to do? I need to be kind and considerate. I want somebody who's honest with me. So what do I need to do? I need to be honest with you and honest with love. So that means that I'm honest with love with you. And I started to see, and it no longer became about what I wanted. It became about who I wanted to be. And as I started to grow towards that ideal, I started to attract the people in my life that I wanted to be with. And that matched me well. And um, that actually became true not only in my uh, sexual relationships, but also just in all my relationships. Recently, my sponsor had me write down the ideals that I wanted in my areas of work. You know, what's the ideal work environment for me? So then when I did that, I was like, well, what do I need to bring to have that? And that exercise can be brought into any area of our life where we don't know where to grow or how to grow or we just keep getting stuck because it will also show us how do I react when I don't get that. It's another way of looking at the same thing of how to get to the motive under the motive. So um, having said all of that, I just want to point one last thing out. On page 70, it talks about if our conduct continues to harm others, we are sure to drink. And I was terrified of that for a long time. But I came to find out that it's when I continue to do the things that I learned in my inventory that that promise comes true. So in other words, if I stop at five, I'm in trouble. That's why we keep going to six and seven, which we'll talk about after lunch. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.